Well, if you guys want to get started, let's start. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, no, that's okay. So, my name is Brian. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Brian Chapman. I'm the owner of Willamette Weapon Lures. I'm out of Vancouver, Washington. And I specialize in match the hatch patterns. So, I actually match the hatch. I'm going to be talking mostly about bass fishing today, but it really relates to anything that's a, an apex predator. So, that includes walleye, it includes smallmouth, largemouth, even to a certain extent, it can, it can include trout. Um, but I'm going to be talking about some of the common species of forage and also some of the not so common things. And what I want you to remember is there's certain techniques that you've developed over the years and certain things that you go, you know what, I use this particular technique and I use it and it works sometimes really well. Some of the stuff I'm going to tell you is going to help you go, you're going to see a, feel a light bulb go off and go, oh, that's why that works so well. And being able to put those pieces of the puzzle together are going to help you catch more bass and walleye and other fish going forward okay so today we're going to be talking about matching the forage base it's the key to bass fishing success i really want to add walleye into it too only because they are an apex predator in our waters um, you can see this is a uh, this happens to be a signal crawdad which is the dominant species of crawdad here in the pacific northwest but we have three different ones on this side of the state that you need to be aware of so um, there's three main species. One is the signal crawdad, and you can tell a signal crawdad because of the, uh, the spot behind the joint on their claw. So right here on the top of the joint, is you'll see a spot. And sometimes I've seen them blue, I've seen them white, I've seen them orange. Um, I actually dive in the water and I catch the crawdads, I catch the bait fish, and then I match them. I don't just grab pictures off the internet. I actually jump in the water and do it. So. This, this happens to be a signal crawdad. We also have, especially up here, we have northern crayfish, which I'm going to show you on one of these slides. Um, northern crayfish has been become the dominant forage or the dominant crayfish species, especially on this side of the state, from Lake Roosevelt, Banks, Moses, Potholes, coming all the way down the Columbia River to right here in our backyard in the Tri Cities area. And I suspect that it's going down further downriver past McNary. A third one that you need to be aware of is the rusty crayfish. And the rusty crayfish, eastern Oregon, John Day River uh, drainage, but because that drains into the Umatilla pool, it's one that I want to point out to you guys. Just so that if you see them, you can call me up and go, Chapman, I saw it, and show me a picture of it. I want to see it. Okay, so this is a signal crawdad, and like I said, um, the you know, there's a couple of characteristics that are really important, but the most important is this joint right here. That's how you can tell whether it's a signal crawdad. I've actually seen similar crawdad colors between different species of crawls. Um, but all signal crawdads have this. And I actually called a, a biologist, which they're called astacologists. Astacologists study crayfish. That's their job. And why they're so important in our ecosystem. I said, hey, I said, Zach, why are they called signal crawdads? And I thought it was because of these bright red, I've seen them bright orange, but I thought it was because of the bright claws. Like maybe they put their claws up like this and said, hello, I'm here, I'm signaling. No, he said it's because of this joint color right here. When, those, when, the, when they escape, they will swim backwards and the, the bass or walleye or whatever's chasing them will get directed to those white spots as they're floating, as they're swimming off. And, uh, that's why they call them signal crawdads. They grow huge. Actually, I've seen them lobster size. The biggest one I've ever caught was close to eight inches long. Big, huge claws. I mean, they're monsters. Um, I'm going to answer questions, I promise. Write them down, and i got a lot to go through, so I promise to answer them. Um, okay, this is a northern crayfish. This is an invasive crayfish into the Pacific Northwest. But they're mostly noted by um, yellow nodules on the claws right here. The majority of northern crayfish have blue on the claws up here. The, you know, the majority of the samples that I've seen from across the country, they all have blue on the shells, but every single one has little orangish yellow nodules on the shells, on the, on the claws themselves. Um, and they breed twice a year, and so they've actually taken over a lot of the native range. And it's in its drainage from Roosevelt Banks, Moses, Potholes, and through the Columbia River, because they breed twice a year, they're taken over. 
and I, it will not surprise me that at some point in the future, the whole Columbia River will be nothing but these. You know, I actually talked to a guy from the Department of uh, Washington Department of Fish and Game when I was at Potholes in August, and he said that 95% um, of the crayfish population in Potholes is this species of crawdad. Okay, this is the third one. This is called a rusty crayfish, and like I said, it's in the John Day River drainage. They were illegally put in there. It was like 20 years ago by a school teacher. They, she didn't do it maliciously, but she didn't want to kill the crayfish either. But they took over. These guys and the and the northern crayfish both breed twice a year, and so they compete for space. The, the reason I want you to pay attention to this one is while I don't have facts that they're in the in the Columbia River. Because the John Day River floods almost every year, if not every year, it's every other year, I would expect to see these crawdads in the Umatilla pool and going down from there. For that sole purpose that they breed so often and they, they're down through that river. Uh, so this is a rusty crayfish, and they call them rusty crayfish because of a rust mark right here on the back of the carapace. And there's all sorts of little markings on the side that they call them rust marks. But they are highly invasive. Let's talk about crawdad color. Um, most of us have probably been taught that crawdads start off in a certain color in the wintertime, then they molt and change color in the spring. I've seen a lot of you nod your heads. And then they molt again and they change color again in the summer, and they molt again and they change again in the fall. This is completely false. Crawdad color is hereditary. The crawdad that blends in the best will survive the longest. It's Darwin at its finest. So if you have a crawdad that lives in around red volcanic rock, it's gonna, the one that's gonna blend in is gonna be a reddish color to the crayfish. A color that, you know, this, this particular one was actually pulled out of Lake Shasta. And I don't know why all that red marks are on there, but something around the rocks where this one was caught ha has a lot of red to it. And so crawdads can come out when they're born, they can come out the whole color of the rainbow. I actually belong to websites that or Facebook pages and TikTok pages that actually sell uh, crayfish in all sorts of colors. I've seen them pink, blue, purple, red, white with pink on them. I mean, they can be any color of the rainbow. But in nature, the one that blends in the best is going to survive the longest. How many? This particular one happens to be a signal product, by the way. Okay, so here's a couple of different colors. So I'm going to go through them real quick. This particular color right here is, I call it Tualatin crop, but this particular color is going to live in an area where you have a lot of silty bottom. There are some rivers, and I know all of you have fished them, where when you go to walk in it, you sink down to your calves because there's so much muck on the bottom. That's where you're going to find that color crayfish. Okay. This particular one was actually a surprise when I was learning about crawdads up here. I was still under the apprehension that they were a certain color during certain times of the year. Well, I caught this one and this one in the same day. And I, so I called, and when I called this guy, I, he goes, crawdad color is hereditary. And it's where they blend in. Well, I said, well, this one's almost red. He says, I'm not fishing, I'm not, I'm not seeing any red rocks here. He goes, turn them over. And I walk over, and I turn the rocks over, and sure enough, they're red rocks underneath all the moss. That's why they're that's why they're red. Okay. This particular one I actually caught up here, actually closer up here, up around um, Crow's Butte. This one's called a Columbia. I call this one Columbia crop. It's one of my best-selling crawdads. But again, you got red rock. You're going to have a lot of red crayfish in that area. Um, let's talk. One thing I can tell you about crayfish is they, while they don't necessarily change color during the year, the shell can be altered in color by what's a thing called biofouling. Biofouling is, um, it's the way I explain it to people when I'm doing my seminars <laughs> is, it's like your truck on a long drive. When you pull out of the driveway in the morning, you usually have a nice clean truck. You know, it's all been soaked down. It's nice and clean. You got a nice silver truck, right? By the time you get to your fishing hole and you turn around and come back, you got bug splatters on the windshield. You got mud on the wheel, you know, on the wheel wells. It gets dirty. Crawdad shells can collect microorganisms, minerals, and um, algae on the shell. And it usually happens during periods of inactivity, usually during the winter time. Uh, and I'm gonna get to that, I promise. But 
The, so the shell, so this particular crawdad, I called, I, I called Zach again. I said, Zach, I said, I found a black crayfish. He goes, they don't exist. And I, he goes, I go, what are you talking about? I got a picture right here, it's black. And he says, it's not black. He says, put it in a tank, feed it some lettuce or something, and get the, um, and let it molt. Feed it until it molts. Just feed it as much as you can until it molts. I fed it, as soon as it molted, it went right back to that one right there. That color right there. That was, it caught it out of the same hole, same day. It's, that's what biofouling is. I've seen them really wild. I've seen them with big red splotches on them where, you know, it, but as soon as they molt, that red goes away. It's, it was algae that was growing on the shell. Some of them I've seen minerals where I see like hints of blue. Down in the, down the Celilo pool, you know, where I like to fish, I, sometimes I've actually seen copper veins going through the shell of the crawdad and it's minerals that are actually attaching themselves to the shells of the crawdads. It's called biofouling and it's a temporary thing. Usually it's during inactivity, but if you have really warm water, where you have a lot of things that are happening with the forage, um, or you know, in the water, a lot of microorganisms, it can build up. But like I said, as soon as they eat, they'll molt and shed that shell. Okay. This is a this is a clean version. I actually went out on a um, a boat out of uh, Astoria that 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 does commercial crawdadding, and I said I'm willing to offer my time on your boat collecting crawdads if you'll let me take just take photos because you don't want to get paid. And I went, believe me. I'm gonna get paid because I'm gonna be getting knowledge about the crayfish. This is a fresh, clean look to these crawdads. It's a freshly molted crawdad. Okay, another thing that can happen to the shells is crawdad shells are not indestructible. They can get crushed, okay? And along those break lines, Mother Nature has this great thing that happens. They get all these little orange markings. I've seen them orange, I've seen them beige, I've seen them red, like you can see on here. This one's more of an orange, but it has hints of red in it. It's like nature's band-aid for a crawdad shell. And it's, it, while it is temporary, it happens to crayfish, and I see it all the time, and most people don't think of it. So, uh, you know, like this particular crawdad, this is a, a, a rusty crayfish that I actually had spit up from a bass in the John Day River. And in the same pool, I caught that other one that I showed you earlier, um, but it has all those orange markings. And if you peel all that back, you'll see the cracks in the shell. And the scientists, I don't even know, if, I, I've been trying to get a hold of them to see if they actually have a name for it. And because not very many people do it, I don't even know if there's a name for it, but I see it common and across all species of crawdad. Uh, so it's something to pay attention to, especially in the summertime months. Um, if you go down to Sil the Celilo pool, this pattern right here, this is an actual crawdad that was spit up by a bass in Celilo. Uh, but I see it common in all the pools. Um, here's a couple of more options. This particular one was caught out of Shasta. And this actually was spit up in January. Uh, a local pro down there uh, had one spit up and he posted it on his Facebook page. And I go, you know what? I, I said, I'm gonna match it and I'm gonna post it on, as, I, he goes, what should I be throwing? Had a spotted bass spit this up. And my smart ass reaches up here and paints that lure right there. And I said, this is what you should be throwing. He called me like two days later and he says, I need some baits painted that way. Because that's what those crawdads look like. Um, Here's another one. I call this one Doomsday Crop. But you can see all the little, see all the little orange markings along here. This particular color of crayfish lives um, on more sandy bottoms. So if you're fishing a lot of sandbars, um, you're going to see this color crayfish around sandy bottoms. But it can be with or without the orange. I like. I think the orange just makes it look just gnarly. You know, when I first started learning how to bass fish. One of the things that I was taught, and one of the things I practiced on a regular basis, was really making the crawdads, whether it was on a jig, or you know, I used to throw a lot of pig and jigs, make that, make that crawdad look crusty. Make it look as realistic as you can. You're gonna get bit more often. And it couldn't be more true. You know, and that's why I make the crawdads look, as, look like I do. I try to make them look anatomically correct, and the colors correct. Uh, here's another one. I actually caught this particular one out of Lake Billy Chinook, so I call it BC crop. Um, but I see a lot of that color crayfish throughout the Columbia River. Um, so I want to talk about some seasonal movements of crayfish. 
Crayfish are a really important part of the forage base. And when I talk about the forage base, I'm talking about what supports everything else. You have bass, smallmouth, largemouth, walleye, has apex predators on the top, and you have other forage that kind of fills in the gap. But crayfish and, believe it or not, yellow perch, in my opinion, make up the majority of that forage base because they're in the river all year long. And it's not the adult yellow perch, it's the juveniles. They, they breed them by the millions and they breed them early and they're in there all year long, fish feed on them all the time. You gotta understand there's certain thing that, things that bass will feed on and walleye will feed on, but ultimately you gotta have something that supports all the entire base. And so in, in my, my research and experience over the last 10 years, I found that it's crawdads and yellow perch that really make up that base in the majority of the waters up here. So for crawdads, spring, the magic number is 48 degrees. If that water is below 48 degrees, those crawdads almost go catatonic. They'll crawl under a rock. Um, we've actually gone diving in certain areas where we've caught a lot of crawdads. I want to see where they live. Um, we've actually seen what we call crawdad condos, where the whole you can actually see holes in the wall of the mud where the crawdads can I don't know if they hibernate. I think they just, their heartbeat gets real, real slow and they pray for warm water. They're like, please warm up. Like right now, when we were driving through the gorge, I'm looking at it going, those crawdads are suffering right now. It's, it's wild. Anything below 48, those crawdads barely move. They'll hide under a rock, they'll hide in a hole, and they just pray for warm weather. As soon as that water temperature hits 48 though, they start coming out but especially with signal crawdads, um, they, the signal crawdads will actually breed in the fall and they will lay their, they, they'll give birth to live babies because you know, they hold them underneath the tail. They'll give, they'll give birth, to, they'll actually let them go in the spring. You know, they, um, but the, they move up and they start, you know, the, the, the males are out there, they start feeding, they start molting. Um, so the crawdads really start moving when it hits 48. So when that, when you see 48 degree water, that's when you start seeing pre-spawn bass. I would imagine that you start seeing pre-spawn walleye, uh, all sorts of stuff, because everything feeds on them, right? Um, during the summer, they're, it's their growth period. That's when they're actively feeding. They're feeding on vegetation, they're feeding on dead fish, dead animals, whatever's in the water. That's what they're actively feeding on. They gotta grow and get as big as they can and as strong as they can during the summertime. During the fall, a lot of times you'll see um, bass fishermen resort to crawdads again. I have a tendency more personally to go more bait fish patterns in the fall. But in the fall, crawdads become very important, especially as that water temperature approaches 50 degrees again. Because those crawdads are not paying attention, they are getting busy. They're doing their thing so that they can reproduce for the spring. Uh, and then in the winter, it's energy con conservation. They're just praying, for, like I said, praying for that warm water. Okay, so let's talk about bait fish. Um, like I said, don't worry, I will have questions. Write them down. I promise to answer them. Uh, but we got time. Okay, so bait fish. So some really big bait fish species that you want to pay attention to. These are what I would consider kind of the primary bait fish species. One, yellow perch. Absolutely freaking lootly yellow perch. From the time that water hits for that magic number at 43, when those root bass and walleye really start getting active, yellow perch spawn early in the season. They spawn at 44, 45, 46 degrees. Before everything else, that mother nature has decided that that's their way of, uh, of survival, is spawning early. So um, look at yellow perch. During the summertime, pike minnow, uh, you know, we all catch those squawfish out there every once in a while. You're getting out there on that riffle and you hook that big squawfish on a jig or on a swim bait or whatever. They, uh, the, the big pikemen or the adults spawn like in May, in May and June. Well, all their juveniles start hatching and they become a really important forage during the summer. So July, August, September, you got a lot of pikemen running around in the river. They become crucially important. And you'll see them up there in the shallows. You'll see them up there, you know, it's that post spawn for the for the bass. And so pike minnow become a really important part of that forage base. Another one that kind of surprised me was sculpin. Sculpin kind of look like, a, for those of you that have ever fished for lingcod, they're like a miniature lingcod. Or, you know, some of, them, some of the species I've seen look like little miniature capazones. Um, or cabazones, sorry. 
Uh, but sculpin are really important. In every river and a lot of the lakes that I've actually swam in, looking for you know what's down there, I see sculpin in. And it's one of those things that's overlooked. So you're gonna find certain lure colors. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a couple of, of them here coming up, so don't worry. But this is a juvenile pike minnow right here. They're very silvery and they've got a dark back and they always have a black dot near the tail. It's one of those deals. If, you know, if, if a bass is chasing it, that black dot a lot of times will swipe at the tail instead of the head and that's how they're able to get away. It's a defensive mechanism. This right here is a, um, it's a juvenile yellow perch. I've actually found three throughout the Pacific Northwest. And I've, stuck, I've gone through a lot of lakes, caught a lot of them, dove and froze to death in some of those lakes looking for these bait fish. And so far I've found three that I can actually match really well. Um, this one I actually caught out of Potholes Reservoir. This is what we typically think of as a yellow perch pattern. These are adults. They are part of the forage base, but when they become adults, I treat them higher up in the food column as more of predators rather than prey. Bass will still eat them, but it's the juveniles that really make up that, you know, that support everything. In other parts of the country, it's threadfin shad, or it could be gizzard shad. I originally came from California where it was primarily uh, Louisiana swamp cross and threadfin shad made up that forage base. Up here, we don't have threadfin shed. We have very few places that have the Louisiana swamp cross. Um, and so, th and this is what I was always thinking is, this is what makes up that forage base. So I started painting all the patterns to look like this. Well, the more I dove into it, this is what really makes up that, that the, you know, what supports everything. It's all these juveniles. They get up, you know, the, it's the two inch to like four inch in length. And they start off really small, and I've seen different areas. So like I said, this particular one, I call it Irresistible Perch. I actually caught this one out of potholes just this last August. Uh, I actually just released the pattern in September. This one right here I call Mjolnir Perch. For those of you that don't know what Mjolnir is, Mjolnir is Thor's hammer. And I call it Thor's hammer because I hammer the fish with it. This pattern right here, this Mjolnir Perch, has not failed me in any body of water that has yellow perch in it. I can always catch them on that mule near perch. I have a feeling the irresistible perch is gonna come neck and neck with that one. This particular one I call Stormbreaker perch. Um, it has more of a green tint to it, and I've seen this one mostly on coastal lakes and coastal rivers. Uh, whereas these are more inland, like that one's you know, lakes, this is more inland on the river. I actually caught this one in the Columbia River. This one I caught out of Silkoos Lake, and this one I caught out of Potholes. Northern Pike Minnow. I mentioned this is another really important part of the forage base, um, especially in the summertime months. You know, everyone was, everyone kept saying, oh man, I hate catching these Pike Minnow. They got a bounty on them. Without them, we, our forage base suffers during the summertime. Okay, so the adults, everyone's seen the adults before, but the juveniles are what really help make up. I would, eat, I, like I said, I would venture to say that I would add that in with the perch and the crawdads, but it's kind of a narrow window when this becomes really, really important. Sculpin, we actually have 11 species of sculpin here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, these are the, the probably three of the dominant ones that I've seen. This one's uh, out of Lake Washington. I actually caught that one out of the Malala River, and this one I actually caught in the Columbia River. They have all the species all over the place, but in different concentrations. Um, but I actually, if you if you take a, if you ever if you any of you guys are on social media, take a look at some of the videos that I've posted. I actually show video underwater as I'm following them following them around, and you can see them darting all over the place. How many of them just in a you know 50 yard stretch of river? In fact, I did that one of the really hot days that we had this last year in August. It was like 118 or something like that. Took the kids swimming, and I'll, right there on the Columbia River, right down on, on the lower pool, and I went swimming for about, probably about three or 400 yards, and was looking for crawdads and what those fish were feeding on, and you could see sculpin, you could see little uh, red side shiners, which I'm gonna show you. You could see crawdads, and some of the crawdads, you could follow them around, and they're just moving around and doing their thing. It's really neat when you can get that underwater view. Here's another pattern 
uh, it's called a P-mouth chub, very common in the Columbia River. And you gotta remember that this all used to be underwater. And as the water receded, so you have overflow into a lot of the lakes. So you may have lakes that have uh, rivers that feed into it, feed out of it. Some of them were before, uh, but this is, a, a, this is native to the Pacific Northwest. They grow up to a, about seven inches long. The mass majority of them are no more than four or five inches long. Um, I bring this one up because it's a neat little thing. Um, let's see, it was in 2017. There were so many of these in the river I had a pattern, that I, have, I have a pattern, I call it the P-mount jump pattern. You could go out and you could absolutely wreck them on it. But I bring this up because, if, how many of you heard of rabbit theory? Raise your hand if you heard of rabbit theory. No, no one? Okay, so there are certain times, there are certain seasons where rabbits will feed on the low hanging food that they can eat, that they can reach by standing up on their haunches, right? During those times when the food is that low, the rabbit numbers, skyrocket. I mean, huge numbers of rabbits. Well, because of this huge number of rabbits, the predators become even more, they, you know, they get even more predators and they keep the, the rabbits in check. Well, when the rabbit numbers go down, you have less predators. So this is one of those ones that I found to be very cyclical. There are certain things that happen in the river. And like I said, I haven't figured out what it is, but when you can identify that they're eating these things, I tell you, it's like them slurping down trout. They will slurp them down like Tic Tacs, and they love them. Um, but it's, a, it's called a P-mouth chub. You can find the juveniles in shallow vegetation. Um, and the juveniles are really what make up the forage. I see a lot of these in the upper Willamette River, up, uh, up above the falls. You can actually see them moving in schools of, you'll see 10 or 20 moving in a school out there on the flats. It's usually during that post-spawn time, like May, June, maybe into July, depending on how warm it gets. Um, but it's something, it's interesting to see. And that rabbit theory works for all bait fish. You know, some, you'll have some years where you'll have a lot more perch, some years you'll have a lot more P-mount chub, sometimes you'll have more years where you've got more red side shiners. There's all sorts of bait fish that are really important. This is a red side shiner. The only time, there's a very narrow window where if you can get these things, you get fish that are feeding on these, it's lights out. You can have the, some of the best days of your life. It happens during the post-spawn, usually the month of June, you know, right around Father's Day. You get about a three-week period where these um, red side shiners, this is a male up here, this is a female right here, but they get into schools of like, um, you know, 20 to 50, and they spawn at night but then they pull out off the edge of the flats during the day. And these smallmouth who are exhausted from spawning will sit out there and just crush them while they're busy trying to you know, attract their mate and do their thing. Um, but so you have a narrow window, but it's really cool. You'll see some lure colors that they go, man, I've done really good on this sometimes and other times it's not. Well, you see a lot of colors that are like this out on the market and this is why. This is one another one of those what I call that rabbit theory uh, bait fish. Here's another one called a twee chub, and they are in the Columbia River. There's a lot of them in the Columbia River, more than you think there are. Um, but it actually it has been brought up in a lot of places because they stock them in um, high, highland lakes for trout. Not all of them. Some it's some of them. So like for instance, um, there's Anna Reservoir down in, in Central Oregon has, they've stocked these to be able to feed all the trout. Well, they took over from the trout, so now they're trying to get rid of them. But because they're, they've become so popular and they're, so, and they're spread out all over, I get a lot of guys asking, hey, can you paint me a tweet chub? I happen to have one already. Uh, so they get up They get up to be about eight inches long. I painted them on glide baits. I primarily sell them in jerk baits and uh, lipless crank baits, but they spawn between late April and early June. That's the time of the year, especially uh, on the Columbia River, that you can see them. This is another one. It's a minor one. They're called leopard daces. You'll see a lot of these more in mountain streams. You'll see them in feeder creeks into lakes, um, but they're, you know, they're, fairly, they're fairly small. They grow up to about four inches. Uh, they move, like I said, faster moving water in, like I said, creeks that feed into lakes, creeks that, creeks that feed into rivers. You'll see them up there as you're, as you're up there fishing. Uh, and then they spawn in the little, the little back eddies in, from late May through July. 
Here's another one that um, was brought to my attention. I actually got a chance to fish with a retired biologist on the John Day River. I was fishing with, uh, if you ever heard of Steve Fleming, he's very well known as a guide on the John Day River. Been doing it for like 30 years. Um, so I got a chance to fish with this guy and he's, you know, a little grumpy, he's 80, you know, but he says, he says, hey, you know, you know, but, you know, we started talking and I started showing him some of these patterns and started proving it to him. And he goes, have you ever tried a chisel chin chub? And I go, what do you, what's that? And he goes, there's a lot of them here in the river. And so he sent me some pictures of ones and some video of ones that he had taken. Um, and so this is another one. They get, they don't get very big, but I've seen there, I've been up in the John Day and swam around and you can actually see them all over the place. And I've heard, I know that they're in other areas. It's, they're native to the Pacific Northwest. Um, let's talk about sunfish. Um, I love throwing sunfish patterns because it's, there's nothing like, you know, you get up into a lake or you get up into a river and you see bluegills everywhere. And a lot of times, especially when they're spawning, bass will get up there and start eating them. And I, I talked to a guy, I actually will go over to um, you know, fish cleaning stations, and you guys see guys, you know, flying out walleye, and you'll see baby bluegills in them. And so I talk about blue. I've got crappie patterns, bluegill patterns. I even have bass patterns. If I have time, I'll explain why I like throwing or when I like throwing bass patterns. Uh, but I have five different bluegill patterns. Uh, I've matched them. The ones that I've seen mostly up here are going to be baby bluegill. This one I actually call bluegill. This one right here, I see a lot of in Oregon, not so much in Washington. This one right here is money over here on this side of the state. Um, and I know that there are some pumpkin seed bluegills, but um, I haven't seen very many of them. I, I see a lot of guys get them for fishing over here. I think they just like the colors on it. Um, but I see a lot of bluegills. In fact, this one right here, when they were draining potholes in August, I. I couldn't resist. I had to jump in the water and look underwater because we actually had good water color up there this year. And I was looking at it and you could see bluegills as that water's coming out of the dunes. You could see bluegills that looked very similar to this. And I was like, I told my buddy, I go, man, we got to try throwing some bluegill patterns. And sure enough, at the mouths of where that water was coming out, those bluegills were staging up, feeding on little perch. And those bass were sitting there munching on anything that they could get moved. And so I saw a lot of this, and that worked really well for us. What's the name of that pattern? So this particular one I call cool gill. This one I just call baby bluegill. This one I call bluegill, because I've been painting that one for about 15 years. This one I call irresistigill. And then that one's a pumpkin seed bluegill. Thank you. OK, this is a my brand new crappie pattern. I've always painted a crappie pattern, because I'm a firm believer that bass will actively feed on crappie, especially in the wintertime. When you have colder water conditions, crappie tend to stack up vertically, and bass love them. They just they, they eat them. Um, so this is my baby crappie pattern. Um, I typically will throw this when I'm seeing crappie spawn, but especially in the winter time. Here's another one called a green sunfish, and this one is really. I'm still working on the color match for this one, but what I'm finding is more and more people are asking for. Um, it's another type of sunfish. It, it, it kind of fits right in there with the bluegills and the crappie. It actually kind of looks like a cross between a bass and a bluegill. Like, you know, they bred and that's what you came up with. Um, but this, so I've seen these a lot, especially on the west side of the state. Um, let's talk about anadronous bait fish. Anadronous means that they live in both fresh and salt. Most of the time, what this means is you have adults that move in in the springtime. They spawn and then they move out in the fall. So you have salmon smolt, for instance, that the, the, the adults move in in the fall. You the big, you got the big push of salmon in the fall, and the juveniles move out in the springtime during when it when the river floods. You know they they spawn and then they uh, or they spawn. The eggs hang out over the summer, or, you know, over the summer or the over the winter in the wintering holes, and then they they you'll see all those smolt and we'll. You know, they'll move out all during when you got that fast moving water through the rivers. Uh, but it, but they're con I kind of consider them anadromous because they're not always in the river. They don't stay in the river year, long, year round. Um, another one is called a killifish. 
Um, the killifish is also anadromous. They live in both salt and fresh. They can actually have a really high salt water tolerance. And you'll see them all throughout the river. Um, I primarily see them in real shallow water. You'll see them in lagoons. I've seen them as far as Astoria and as far up as um, Boardman. Uh, this one right here is called a stickleback. Sticklebacks are also anadromous. Any late body of water that leads, leaks out in the ocean will have that bait fish move into it. They move, you know, they can live in both salt and fresh. I've actually been <coughs> in rivers where you can actually see those, and they actually look like little schools of anchovies swimming around. Um, I actually, I'm going to show you a picture of one. Um, here's another one. Oh, this is another one. It's called an American, it's an American Chad. They move in as adults. These become really important in the fall. When you get out in you know, September, October, even into November, depends on how long it takes that water temperature to drop. But the, the adults move in in the spring, they spawn, their juveniles stay in the river all summer long, and then as that water temperature starts to drop, you'll see them get into huge schools. We've seen giant schools up around Boardman, uh, just below McNary, where, I mean, you'll see schools that are like the size of a Volkswagen bug swimming around out there. And what happens is, they, they, it's like they swim along and start collecting all their buddies, getting ready to head out to the ocean. Well, when they get ready to head out to the ocean, that water temperature, when it drops down around 50 degrees, they just start going boom, right back out, right out to the ocean, and they spend their time growing out in the ocean um, before they come back as adults. So this becomes, like I said, you know, the smaller adults play a, play a, a role in bass's, uh, bass's diet, but the juveniles, especially in the fall, really make a big difference. Um, here's some salmon smolt. You got a chinook, you got a coho. We talked about the salmon smolt. This is that killifish. They don't grow very big, but when you can see them up there cruising the shallows and you see a bass spit one up, oh, yeah, they work good. Um, this, coincidentally, this is one of the patterns that I really like to throw as what I call an indicator pattern. Um, because it has a lot of attributes, while it matches the killifish, it has a lot of attributes of both yellow perch and bluegills. And so if I'm trying to figure out whether the bass are eating bluegills or perch, I will throw that pattern just as an indicator until I can go, yeah, they're eating it, or no, they're not, and then I can switch to something else. This is that stickleback. And I actually found, they actually, there's two, spe two primary species. This one, it would be a female version, this would be a male version of the same species of stickleback. Uh, they grow up to about four inches long, and like I said, they look like little schools of anchovies swimming around. This one right here is actually me holding one uh, that I caught. Uh, we're out there at uh, we were fishing a tournament out of Boardman, and I had a smallmouth spit it up on the deck, and I squatted down to sit there and take video of it because it's still kind of twitching and you know getting its, you know still moving. And my buddy goes, what are you doing? He says, put your, call the fish. And I go, I gotta take care of this real quick. I'm gonna match this thing because it's gonna work. Um, so I match, so I, I, like I said, I specialize in match the hatch. Um, trout, I consider it part of the forage base, but it's more towards the top. You know, um, while bass will feed on them, I don't see them as being, what I would say, a dominant forage species for bass. There are certain times of the year when um, you know, bass need to have what's calorically beneficial food. That means you, the more calories you can get into for the least amount of work, the better. And so usually trout are swimming around, they're moving around. Bass are like, oh, where are you going, where are you going, where are you going? But there are times of the year, particularly in the fall or during colder water months, when a bass can swallow one of these and it won't have to eat for two weeks because it, it, they, you know, bass being cold-blooded, they metabolize everything very, very slowly. Um, I see it mostly in lakes, especially Banks Lake, um, Roosevelt Lake, um, some other areas, you know, a lot of kokanee up there. They're, they're gonna feed on the smaller kokanee. And this particular pattern, in particular, when those kokanee move up to spawn, this is what, what a female would look like. The males get those bright colors and the big hook jaws on them. Um, but the females are the ones that are, the males are up there nesting, doing their thing, and they've got those teeth and they're super aggressive. But the females are out there be, waiting to be herded into the nest, and those bass are sitting there going, <laughs> they're full of eggs. Full, it's, they're calorically beneficial. So I include them, but if you've ever fished Roosevelt, 
you know those fish will attack anything. They will literally eat any crankbait you throw out there when you find a school of them. Um, here's another one that I've seen, uh, that I've caught a lot of, and in particular in the spring, you know, they, they move in in May, they're coastal cutthroat trout. They, these are another anadromous species of trout that move from saltwater to freshwater. And so you won't find them in a lot of lakes unless it le feeds out into the ocean. Uh, here's a, a typical stalker rainbow trout. I actually caught this one in Lacamas Lake uh, over, on, over in Vancouver, and, uh, or is it Camas, sorry. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be working on matching that one. Um, so w one more thing before, before I uh, open it up to questions. Um, there's other items on the menu. Okay, one of them, and a lot of you that fish for walleye recognize this, these are called Siberian prawns. They are shrimp They're, that, are, that live in our rivers. And a lot of times, I've heard so many guys um, say, hey, you know, there's all these shrimp that live in the river and I'm cutting, up, cut, cutting open my walleye and they're full of these little Siberian prawns. Um, I do it, even though it's not a major part of the forage, it, you can see them, like, uh, I've seen them a few times where they look like, like buzzing flies, but underwater. You see just, just, just skirting all over the place. And both bass and walleye will chow down on them when they cross them. Like I said, I don't consider them a major part of the forage, but there are times when those bass and walleye will absolutely feed on them. Um, this one is a surprise to everyone that I've ever told about it. How many, you know that we have, uh, these are also anadromous. Um, the adults come in as lamprey eels. They come in every spring to spawn. Their juveniles are called amicets. The juveniles, so they spawn, you know, the, the lampreys will spawn, and the, the juveniles will stay in the river for four to five years, and they, they'll grow from like, you know, little tiny larvae up to about eight inches long. And then they, what happens is they go through what's called a metamorphosis, and they'll actually develop eyes and that suction cup underneath them. Okay, as soon as they make that metamorphosis, it usually happens during the winter time, and not all of them do it at the same time, but a big group of them will metamorph, you know, do that, go through that metamorphosis, and they'll start, they'll start schooling up like bait fish, and they'll go up back, they'll go out to the ocean where they'll grow up and actually become adults. But here's the thing you need to remember about um, about amicets: all predator fish will feed on them. The reason they feed on them is this is this little thing right here has the highest caloric intake of anything in the forage base. Now, while it's not a really important one, it's like the, the way it was explained to me by a bi biologist at uh, ODFNW, he said, it's the equivalent of us eat, sitting down at a meal and eating five greasy hamburgers for eating one of these. I mean, it's thousands of calories and there's no bones in them, it's all cartilage. So when a bass or a walleye can eat them, they can eat them, swallow it, digest everything. And it's all calories. It's like, pack, it's just, they can just pack on weight. And when you can realize, or when, you're, when you find out that they're feeding on those things, oh, it can be all the difference. Now, here's for those of you that are walleye fishermen here, these are most active at night. And so you may have patterns that, or areas that you fish, and you go, man, they hit this one particular pattern. I don't know why. But as you're dragging it, dragging your jig, you know, your worm harness behind the, you know, behind the boat, or you're trolling a lure, or whatever it happens to be, they could be feeding on these because they're most active at night, and there's, they're packed full of calories. Okay, 